Hello, and welcome back to the Star Trek CCG video series where we talk about and open up uh, all the 17 boosters from the first edition. Today we're running through the first contact expansion set, which came out at the end of 1997, had 130 cards, 40 commons and uncommons, 50 rares. Uh, and one of the big changes uh, with this set is that the booster packs are now consisting of nine cards, uh, the same beginning, three uncommons, one rare, uh, but only, uh, what, five? I guess doing the math, five, five commons uh, as opposed to, to, to many more. Uh, so what did First Contact do for, uh, for gameplay? Well, obviously it introduced the first entirely new affiliation in the Borg. And it's not only a new color to play in, but rather a complete new rule set which wasn't explained if you only look at the cards themselves, but you had to get the information from the rules insert or wherever it was hidden or on the website. But they play by entirely different rules in that they don't attempt missions the way other affiliations do. Rather, they use scouting, which follows its own rules. And it's, it's very interesting in the way that they have the Borg Queen to tie them all together. And then they have lots of uh, drones that have very specific abilities that you can use in particular situations. Very similar, they uh, are all either uh, 557 or 575 or 755 as far as the attributes uh, are concerned. And they allowed you to, to do a lot of powerful stuff, but you had to be very meticulous in, in playing them because uh, Borg made use of one of the other new mechanics that was introduced, the objective card. And Borg only had one single objective at a time. So they could either decide that mm -hmm. now we need to establish a transwarp network gateway somewhere, and then they did that. And if they wanted to do something else, they had to play um, a card that allowed them to change the objective or fulfill that other objective first and then do something else, like assimilate a starship or shoot at a starship so they they couldn't do anything without a card that specifically allowed them to do just that and that is still today something that many people find very difficult because it's just so different from how the other affiliations play it borg rules have changed over the years but this was a a something brand new that was a a very good thing to to freshen up the game and introduce um, the the big baddie in that environment there. There is also another interesting mechanic that we can see on several of the personal cards, and that's the little red triangular icon that we find in the skills box, uh, which is the special download icon that allows you to, once per game, uh, look through your deck or Q's tent for that specific card and play it immediately. So there were some very powerful ones, like on Jordi LaForge, you could download Ocular Implants, which then lets you look at seed cards under a mission. So obviously very, very powerful because it gave you more, action, uh, more options to find that card. And also it allowed you to play that card for free. And as we mentioned on our previous episode, those were the, all then uh, cards that you could stock in your Q's 10 side deck, for example. And we also find new versions of the Federation bridge crew. Apparently First Contact had just come out, so we get new versions of Picard, Riker, and so on with slightly different skills dependent on the, on the role they played in the film. And we also find a new icon to the left side of the, of the lore box where you would usually find the gold star or the silver star that indicates staffing. With the Federation Bridge Crew, we now find the little communicator thingy, the Enterprise E icon, which fulfills the very specific purpose here of staffing the big Enterprise E that came out in this set. Johannes, you know uh, from the videos before that I love pulling Federation. We pulled an Enterprise from, from the get-go. When I play this game, I played Federation. So I'm looking at this set, I'm looking at this bridge crew, this Enterprise, you know, I'm thinking, which one should which one should I play? Like, what does it mean when you choose to play the first contact bridge crew and the Enterprise E versus the the original? How how does that fit in the gameplay now? I think first of all, the Enterprise E only makes sense if you have the full bridge crew or enough uh, of the bridge crew to make sure you can stuff it and that you can uh, actually use it. And I think it was actually quite nicely balanced. You with the uh, first contact bridge crew. 
you got some useful downloads, but you gave up uh, the odd skill here and there. For example, when it comes to, uh, to Jordi LaForge, I usually would go with the first contact Jordi simply because his download of ocular implants is so very powerful. And looking at the skills, you don't actually lose much. What you lose is the navigation skill, I believe, but you get uh, a leadership in return for that and the extra download. So in this case, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the uh, first contact Jordi. And at the time, simply because there were new versions, uh, I was very excited to get uh, the first contact guys. We opened the pack. I'm going to hope we open up one of those for sure. Now, now you mentioned the enterprise, you know, the, the, the benefit of the new, the new Jordi. How hard was it to get this, uh, the engine working? You know, the enterprise E, you need to have one of the six, not Worf, because he, he didn't have that staffing icon, staffing the enterprise E. How hard was it to get one of like two of those six characters out and, and staff that enterprise E? Well, with the cards that I had, and I didn't have a lot of packs back then, um, it was almost impossible. So with only the few packs I bought, I, I couldn't, I, I could never build a, a working Enterprise E uh, bridge crew deck. Um, if I play the deck now where I can just print the cards uh, I need or play online, I'm usually a big fan of including multiples, even of unique personnel, and then just use them for um, functions that allow you to discard cards. When I look at old deck lists from the time, I noticed that most people only played one copy of a universal personal because extra copies were simply dead cards and there wasn't a lot of um, stuff to do with them. But as the game progressed, we see cards that allow you to discard one card and get an effect like that. And then it was um, easier to play with, with multiples of uniques. Or Got you it. could also just uh, put them all in the Q's tent, play with lots of Q's tent, and then play that. Now I get out Picard. Now I get out Riker. Now I get out Data on my next turn. So that would be one uh, viable way of, of playing it. Got it. So it sounds like you're staffing multiple of the same card, or, or sorry, including multiples of the same card in the deck in the Q's tent really just makes it pretty easy for you yeah. to get the people you need um, when you need them in, in gameplay. Okay. Yeah. And one more question, Johannes, this, this, this set really changed a lot. So, you know, I'm kind of you know, behind the curve trying to like figure this set out because I didn't play it too extensively. You mentioned the downloading piece and you said something like it's a free play. Could you download as many times as you wanted in a turn if you had, you know, like, like Jordy with the Acular Implants and a few other cards that could download? As far as I believe at the time, there was no limit. Later on, there was a card called Containment Field that punished you for excessively using special download icons but at the time there was nothing that that hindered you i think the only limitation was that you could only use the special download on a particular uh, personal or on a particular card once per game so if you used geordi and downloaded the ocular implants then geordi was killed then you couldn't play another geordi and download another copy of ocular implants because you had already done that wow so okay the effect doesn't follow the card um it just happens so if you play a new card you can't use it again oh interesting right. hmm. yeah a lot going on from a from a player perspective um wow how about from a from a collector perspective um what did first contact do first contact was a lot of fun and first contact is actually one of those the one of the very few if not the only set that in the 20 something years since it's been out has never dropped below retail um, I, I've never seen this below the original 279 a pack. Um, or if it did, it did it very, very briefly. Um, partially because um, one of the fixed sets that came shortly after it had a mechanic that would actually let you open a pack and assimilate everything in that pack. It's called, I believe, add distinctiveness. Um, so there was always a market for packs if you were playing Borg. Um, that said, this is the first set that moved away from the 11 by 11, 121 card print sheet. Um, this had a 10 by 10 print sheet for the rares. Uh, so there are two copies of each of the 50 rares on that print sheet. Um, it is the first set that reduced the common count. So even though there were a lot of them that you could have used multiple copies of, it, uh, you, you didn't get as many in your packs as you were fishing, uh, it means that there's less of them out there uh, just available on the market. Um, from a collector's perspective, you've got the entire 
bridge crew again. So you've got a bunch of folks fishing for that bridge crew for autographs, for collections, for decks, for all the things. So that makes them sought after uh, even very much still to this day. Um, the uh, like Decipher talked about doing a bunch of uh, Easter eggs. The, this one has another one of those uh, lore Easter eggs on the Reginald Barkley card. It says member of team alpha acknowledging his uh, time on the A team as Mad Dog Murdoch. Um, I see. There's, there's a bunch of stuff like that in there. Uh, it's also the first set that introduced the uh, expansion icon on the right side of every card, which for all of these future sets makes it much easier when you are sorting out a collection to go and, and figure out which set this came from. Especially from my perspective, you know, not seeing these cards over the years, I'm coming back into the game and it's just so convenient exactly to look. And later on, you could actually see the number of the card and the rarity, which further made it easier for someone like me, not knowing these cards to kind of understand. But yeah, the set icon certainly is something that stood out to me. Exactly. I think there's some big picture things here too. We're talking about a time for Decipher when they're moving beyond their original license as the Star Trek The Next Generation customizable card game. And we start to see them branch out into all the other series that we come to know in this set. We also see nothing for Klingon and Romulan personnel. It's still a quite an imbalanced game in terms of skill sets and card types. And so I think apart from a few non-aligned cards, there's not too much for, for, those, for those collectors here. It'll be a while before we see a rebalancing on that front. In a way, it almost feels quite unique. It almost feels like a mini game in a way. You could almost imagine this being a, a Federation versus Borg. You're trying to recreate the movie in many ways. It doesn't fit into the overall arching, especially with the staffing icons that place the limits on the use of the ships that we talked about. Uh, we'll see a rebalancing of that with a card in a future expansion, but the Enterprise E is never brought back into play with that type of mechanic. We see text on cards, both of the Federation starships having plus to weapons and shields against Borg, which is again consistent with that mini game Federation right. versus Borg <laughs> type uh, type setup. So it really is quite different. It doesn't mean there aren't cards that, that there are lots of cards that will still see play or still see relevance into the future. But when it comes to the personnel and collecting it, you really are just sort of recollecting the person, the bridge personnel that you love in that sort of context. So it is a little bit different than future expansions, which are, are usually broader, I think. It's one of the few expansions, because uh, when I was collecting this uh, back when it was new, I was also collecting the Star Trek trading cards. And it's one of the few expansions that actually felt like it was very similar in what you were looking for when you were collecting the trading cards as you were with the CCG because it was so self-contained to that one movie. What are the cards that we, we want to open, Johannes, from a, from a player perspective um, as we're going through this pack? Well, there are a lot of cards that, that as a player, I'd, I'd love to open depending on what I, what I want to play. If I want to play Borg, I'd love to see the Borg Queen. If I want to play Federation, obviously, the the enterprise and i was also very fond of the data that came out and as i mentioned the the geordie with this uh download what i've found very interesting in this set is that it really stepped up the dilemma game a little bit because there are a couple of cards that have very unique interactions there is dead end which is a staple card in almost any deck to this day there is scout encounter which does very interesting things and there is also, if I'm not mistaken, lack of preparation in it, which is a very good card to discourage red shirting. We have a super good space dilemma in Maglock, which is a common. Um, and those things made it really, really interesting to, uh, to play dilemmas. And another card that when I went through the list that I didn't realize uh, was actually released in the set is Ready Room Door, because that introduced a subgroup of cards um, who are then called the Captain's Order cards. And Ready Room Door is a doorway, so it plays for free. And it was very powerful in that it allows you access to all those Captain's Order cards. And one of them that was also released in this set is Assign Mission Specialists. It lets you start the game with two personal you seed it, and then you can immediately download to mission specialists or personnel who have exactly only one regular skill uh, to your outpost. And you can play it again and again. And with Ready Room Door, you can actually download it. And as we said, downloading is playing it. So you 
more or less played for free. At the start of your turn, you would discard the assigned mission specialist and then you'd play another one and you get all those cheap personnel that only have a single skill. And then with this bonus point mechanic introduced on assigned mission specialist, you could then solve a lot of missions for more than the 35 points printed and sometimes even uh, do a uh, two mission win because you could easily get 50 points or more from a single mission. So that was really, uh, as, as far as I know, the introduction of the popular round the corner strategy where you'd, you, would, you would still look at solving missions to score your points, but you could also do it with, with fewer missions. Of course, there are other point strategies like um, Borg ship hunting, where you just blow up the Borg dilemma and, and score points that way. I'm not exactly sure when they actually introduced um, solving missions as a requirement to, to win the game and not just uh, score points. But that's definitely something that uh, the assigned mission specialist in the Red Rim world is still being used today. All right, Hannes, can you clarify that point? So in the game today, you have to solve at least one mission in order to win? In And I'm talking about uh, virtual cards and the sanctioned formats for world championships and so on. Uh, sure. The standard format now requires you to solve a planet mission and a space mission and have 100 points. And in Premier, you, you simply had to get 100 points and you could do all kinds of stuff. You can just uh, seed the popular copy of Barclay's Protomorphosis Disease, uh, do that for 10 points, run into your own Cytherians, wormhole to the other end of the space line and do that just four times and then you'd have... Uh, 100 points without actually completing a mission. So that was still possible uh, in the early days. Got it. All right, how about from the, uh, the collector perspective? What, uh, what do we want to open? So Decipher has learned its lessons about missions. There is only one rare mission in the set and only a couple total, but the rare mission in the set is actually one that's quite in demand. So that's not actually too bad a one to open. It's one of the sets where there's a very large number of cards you would actually like to pull. So we've had uh, the highest value is, of course, going to be the Enterprise E, actually followed shortly thereafter by the Borg Queen herself. So the Borg Queen will actually outdo many of the Federation personnel. Johannes has mentioned some of the dilemmas, so we actually see some value in dilemmas here, Scout Encounter. And for those that haven't seen Johannes's series of videos, he has a great video on showing the power of that card. Uh, theta Radiation Poisoning is an incredibly significant dilemma. This is one you resolve with engineering time six, I believe. So that was a hefty one. Uh, retask also comes up significant here. On the personnel side, I mentioned the Borg Queen. We have Admiral Hayes. He actually has text that provides bonuses to a ship's weapons and shields, even though he's a, a personnel card. We have then the bridge crew. So running through Beverly Crusher, Data, Deanna Troy, Joy LaForge, Sean Luke Picard. Uh, Reginald Barkley, not technically bridge crew, but a new iteration of Reginald Barkley is quite welcome. Uh, William T. Riker, Worf. We also have the Queensborg Cube, which is quite a welcome rare to see, the Queensborg Sphere, and the Enterprise E. There are some uncommons and commons that are of interest. So remodulation is an uncommon that still has some value because of its utility in the game. The uncommon Borg Cube is simply just spectacular in its, in its own right. We have the introduction of the EMH program, which is a wonderful connection, both yes. in the movie itself to have Robert <clears throat> Picardo and also just seeing something outside of the standard franchise that we'd seen so far in TNG. Uh, he's also downloadable with uh, Beverly Crusher in this, so that's quite good. And also Lieutenant Hawk, who I admit having a soft spot for because you see him pop up in this film. You know, he's like he's like the new guy on the bridge, and then he comes to a to an unpleasant end that we see here. So I think he gets a little bit of a little bit of love here too. On the common side. We have established gateway, awaken, transwarp gateway network, and assign mission specialist as being above average for market prices in these sets. I'm hoping again for one of those blue cards. I know there's the Borg Queen. There's a lot of the good cards you mentioned, but uh, this is kind of the last chance um, for us to open again that uh, that, that uh, next generation bridge crew. So before you continue, uh, obviously, for those looking at the pack, we're seeing a new style of pack, mm. which will see us through the rest of the series, artwork themed around the expansion. But I feel I kind of owe an apology to the blue packs. I had a, I, I had a bit of a, gave them a bit of a rough time in our last video. But there's a fun note here. There is a poster you can get. There was obviously an advertising poster for game stores to say the game was coming out, which actually in, showed what they thought the pack would look like at the time. And it's actually really nice. It's the blue theming, but with a creeping black motif indicating this sort of assimilation look of what you have around that. So 
Mm. Even though I love the artwork direction they go in with these packs, I really would have loved to see that partially assimilated pack look, even if it meant having one more blue pack to go forward. So apologies to the blue pack, you were denied your moment of glory. But I think most people are quite <laughs> fond of the new artwork of the new packs that we have going forward. It does feel like the end of the era with those blue packs, uh, for sure, as like you had mentioned. We'll see a lot of interesting designs moving forward. And again, nine cards here, you know, many fewer commons, although the three uncommons, one rare is still, still going strong. So here we go. First contact, which Jan had mentioned, value has just not gone down um, since day one. This is a nice, easy open. Starting out with a big, a big gun. Starfleet type three phaser rifle. All right. So this is a card that actually appears as one of the things that can be downloaded. So we have, I forget if he's uncommon or common, but we have a Federation crewman with a uh, Starfleet Type 3 phaser download option available to him. So there's a case of a less significant card in terms of skills and abilities becoming more valuable because it has this, this unique ability to download this equipment. I think it was Hawk, your, your, your guy. No, uh, it's Light, Light, I believe. Yes, there you go. Someone else, okay. All right, next on common, we have, oh, the Red Room Door. Johannes, can you mention what this is all about again? You mentioned it uh, before. Yes, so Red Room Door has uh, different functions. And if you read the text, it calls out Captain's Order Cards. And it lets you download one of these. And Captain's Order Cards include, for example, Captain's Log, which gives you a plus three to weapons and shields if you have a matching commander aboard. Also, lower decks which boosts all your universal personal attributes by plus two. And assign mission specialists, when it was printed, it was originally a captain's order. They found out at some point that this is too powerful and then they, uh, they changed it. And what's interesting about Ready Room Door is that once you had it, after use, you could put it on top of your deck. So the next time you draw a card, you're guaranteed to get your Ready Room Door again. So you could chain it nicely and, and get all those captain's order cards out one at, uh, at a time every turn. And it also had the function to download to one of your ships its matching commander at the cost of not drawing cards that turn. But that um, gave you a, a fighting chance against some of the better decks. So if you already have your, your Enterprise out, you can get your captain's log and you can also get the Picard with this card. So very versatile. Does that, does, is that as broken as it sounds? Basically, you get to put this on top of your deck and just basically draw every like any card you want for as long as you want every turn? Not necessarily because you're not drawing any other cards or you're not drawing a, a different card then. Right. You, you're getting the cards you need at the point, but you usually need some other way of drawing more cards mm -hmm. okay. because then otherwise with this, you, you'd be limited to all those captain's order cards. My last uncommon is, uh, you mentioned good dilemmas. How good is, the, is Blended? Blended has interesting text in um, that it calls out specific traits and it forces somebody to continue. So um, if you have more than uh, one diplomacy, then stop all but one of those personal. So uh, you, you can force the opponent to run into uh, a worse dilemma that, that comes later. So mm. it's a kind of fun card here, but if you have something, for example, in a later set, there is a card that does bad stuff if you don't have two diplomacy. So with this card, you can filter out all but one diplomacy. So one guy has to go on and face the next dilemma. And hopefully... Uh, suffer the, the bad consequences that the dilemma brings. It's not necessarily the most powerful dilemma, but there is some fun stuff you can do with it. Well, here we go. Here is a rare. And again, I'm going to play this game for the last time. You're trying to get that blue Federation symbol for our rare. I love one of those Federations. What do we have? We do not have a Federation. We've got, what was that, interrupt? Interrupt, yep. Uh, we have an interrupt. Here we have weak spots. Not bad at all for a board killer deck, or honestly, mm. for almost any of your battling decks. Mm. Um, kind of a fun moment in the in the film. This is right before the board, uh, the whole cube exploded, right? That's right. The, okay, right. 
It's a card that does see some relatively quick market shifting because of the cumulative component again normally, but it says not cumulative mm -hmm. here. So people are interested, but it doesn't usually make a huge, huge difference. So it's not fascinating, but it's not bad either. It's kind of fun. Okay. One of the commons. Now we have a blue. Maybe they misseeded one of the cards here. What do we have? Joseph Travis. Oh, our first board. All right. You had mentioned the five, five, seven, or five, the fives and sevens. There they are. Yep. All right. Sabotage drone. A lot of Borg also come with text. I know we mentioned that as a 2E phenomenon, but with many Borg, you see you see text on the card as well as the skills and the basic components as well. So usually some some additional function beyond just a standard crewman. Yes, and one right. of the difficulties in playing Borg is that with especially with the cards that came out in later sets, you have a very good engine of more or less accessing any card in your deck that you want. You can uh, download any drone you want, but that also means you have to, to know exactly what each drone does so that in whatever situation comes up, you know what do I need to get out now? Do I want to beam through my opponent's shields? Then I need this drone. Do I go into personal battle? Then I need to download this drone first and so on. So there are a lot of cards that have special functions. And as a new player who, who doesn't have the, that knowledge, you will often end up looking through a deck, oh, do I need this, do I need this? And one hour will, will go by as quickly as you can say, six or 17. So quite difficult. Let me ask you one clarifying question though, Johannes. When you download like a drone, do you have to identify the name of the card before you go digging through your deck or can you just dig through your deck in that kind of half hour and decide what you want that fits the download? If, if it says download a drone, then you can look through your deck and um, just look at different options and then then choose that. Of course, you should never stall. You should never do it to uh, to to buy time in the game. But sometimes when I think I I want to download this and then actually hang on, that might actually be a good option. You you can do that. You don't have to announce it in particular if it gives you uh, more options. I'm also you can download the... from. I'll oh, go ahead, Tom. I'm also seeing the Delta symbol on this card as well. That's something we'll see Ooh. for Delta Quadrant cards later. We'll also see a Gamma Quadrant symbol. But this is, uh, again, the first time I'd seen one of those. And when I first opened a card like this, I didn't know what that was all about at the time. Yeah. I think at the time, there was actually no Delta Quadrant mission. So if I remember correctly, there was some kind of weird addition in the, in the Borg rules where you start with a conceptual Borg outpost somewhere that you couldn't actually play in the Delta Quadrant because there, uh, at the time there was no Delta Quadrant mission. So there were still uh, a lot of gaps that they uh, would fill in, in later sets. Yeah. I believe the first contact rules insert actually says this, this icon will be used later. Okay. Um, I'm not positive of that, but I believe that was the case. Mm -hmm. And speaking of new icons, we have a number four in green here. Johannes, do you want to tell us about that? Ah, yes, that's the so-called uh, countdown icon. So um, when this card, or at the end of your turn, this little four here counts down, and when the countdown uh, hits zero, then the card will be discarded. So in this case, as long as the card is in play for four turns here, uh, the effect is in play, and uh, once the opponent has set out that countdown, uh, then... They don't have to uh, to worry about that anymore. Um, I was just wondering, is this also the introduction of hidden agendas? I believe so. Yes. So that's the little uh, blue card back icon you see on the uh, on the very left, right here. That, yeah. yeah. That means when you see this or when you play it, you play it face down. You announce hmm. it as a hidden agenda, and then you can reveal it at an opportune time to use its effect. For example, in this case with the countdown. You don't want to waste it early on, but you wait until the moment is right when you think that your opponent might be playing uh, those cards, and then you can uh, turn it face up, and that's that. And I think the rule was that at the end of the game, you had to show that your hidden agendas were actually valid hidden agendas, otherwise you would have to forfeit the game. Also, the longer I look at the face that Patrick Stewart is pulling on this card, the funnier it becomes. So just, <laughs> just stare at it for 10 seconds and tell me it's not funny. Yeah. And Johannes, yeah, you can flip this over anytime you want. You don't need another gameplay card or mechanic to allow you to flip this. Um, you could flip it over as an action during your turn. So like, a, like beaming or so, uh, that would be uh, simply an action. And one of the weirdest things in, 
in Star Trek CCG is what's called valid responses, which makes everybody's head uh, explode because nobody ever knows when is something a valid response to something. And that would be far too technical to delve into that. But yes, there are cards that you can flip at the exact moment when you need them. More commons, establish gateway. So there's one of the objectives for the Borg and a point value on it. That's how Borg scored. Maybe we should uh, mention the um, the probing. We haven't touched upon that. That's another uh, function mm. that is introduced here. So the way Borg do the missions, they don't check mission requirements, but rather when they have successfully cleared out all the dilemmas, they probe, meaning they reveal the top card of their deck. And then you look at that card and you have a look whether you find one of those icons mentioned on the established gateway there. And if you hit the blue or the green Borg drone icon, then the game text tells you what to do. In this case, you have probed successfully, the sector is cleared, you score your points and so on, which is one of the reasons why the Borg Queen is so popular because she has the blue, the green and the red Borg icon. Mm. So she is a good card to have for all your Borg uh, objectives. And that's why many people play with a lot of uh, Borg drones, uh, sorry, Borg queens in their deck, sometimes as many as 20, so that you have very good chances of hitting a Borg queen and all your, your probe attempts will be successful. What's this red Borg icon? I mean, is that just a hidden agenda for the Borg? Borg only. Borg only. That means you can only use it in, in Borg decks. You couldn't put this card in a Federation deck. Another drone. Oh, we're back to the beginning, right? Yeah, only nine yep. cards. So there's our, there's our rare weak spot. Nope. So I think thinking back on this, much like yourself, it was around the time that I stopped sort of playing and collecting originally. Um, a few things I noticed, I mean, I still think in a way people say the, the, you know, the, the heyday, the golden days of the game is still ahead of us with the DS9, Dominion, uh, Blaze of Glory era. But I was starting to notice a significant increase in the type of these new abilities, these new functions. You know, it's not just a new objective card, it's probing, it's staff, new staffing icons, all of these. Or some of the cards like Ready Room Door, which is this sort of wall of text. And that, you know, as a sort of hyperactive 14 year old, I could understand the simple mechanics of the earlier expansions, whereas this one is like, oh, you know, okay, how much do I have to read this? What's the synergies and everything else? What do I have to do? So as much as I loved it, it was that sort of the start of the creep, which although the game, I think, significantly benefited from a lot of these new mechanics and a lot of these new types of way you could play the game and interact with it, it does, be, it's the very tip of the iceberg of the beginning of the bloat, which sort of comes a lot long further down the line. We were talking about also many of the other things that crop up in this expansion, just many little mechanics that you'll find on other cards in the set. We mentioned the example uh, intermix ratio is an interesting card. We've seen examples of ways to score points beyond missions and intermix ratio is we're trying to constrain decks that were built around scoring a lot of points outside of just completing missions versus just doing other, other activities. So we'll some, see some feedback here for, for gameplay mechanics and just some fun little ones like mirror image, which I just liked because the image was mirrored on mirror image. So I thought that was fun when I kind of encountered it. So there's, there's lots of little quirky things hidden away in this deck. Plus, I believe something I never really read about was also if you look at some of the non-line cards, such as the Phoenix and the Vulcan Lander, we see text referring to abilities to land ships and take off ships, which is not something I'd seen in previous expansions. Any closing thoughts about uh, about First Contact? This uh, First Contact introduced one additional mechanic, which was time locations. Um, and I will admit that's uh, <laughs> that's where the, the rules lost me. I still haven't quite figured that one out. <laughs> um, I this, this was around the time I played my last game. My brother managed to put together a board deck. Um, and uh, and that we had a rough game and didn't play much anymore after that. <laughs> but time locations is actually the single most requested topic that I've had for explanatory videos on on Star Trek CCG, and I 
still haven't got the script to the point where I'm happy with it because, as you say, it's <laughs> it's complex. It's calling out how beautiful the Enterprise -E is as a ship, and I think they did a great job with the card. As I thought it was a ship, there's many people who use house rules of replacing the the modified staffing icons with standard staffing icons just because they want to use it, and it's a nice fun ship for the Federation to yeah. use. Also, I really enjoyed the the USS uh, Bozeman in this set. Obviously, a lovely callback to the next generation of a said time and again, time and again. Mm. Uh, also, seeing you know, having some abilities against the Borg that was a wonderful little addition. I thought. I do think again, it's sad there wasn't any real sort of carrots in there for the for the Romulan or the Klingon players, but it's the beginning of a real expansion of the game that I that I, that I think has been enjoyable to come back to, even though I never played it that much at the time after this. I mean, to this day, I still mostly play Premier AU and Q as 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 my, as my go to to avoid that sort of rule creep and uh, level of understanding that you need to play it. I'd just like to share my favorite uh, first context uh, opening story. Sure. Go for it. In Enhanced First Contact, there will be a card coming that if you are behind in points, it allows you to actually take a First Contact booster from outside the game and open it and put the cards uh, in play, which is the kind of, I don't know, meta thing that you wouldn't actually uh, expect on on normal cards. And it's, it's really just this very weird thing. Oh, yes, if you're ever behind in 40 uh, points, just in case, bring a few extra boosters, you might uh, be able to open them. And while I didn't see it myself, apparently uh, at World Championship 2013, when Stefan Slavi, a very good Austrian player, won the World Championship, he did exactly that in a World Championship final game. He was behind in points and then he apparently brought out some boosters. So I'm going to do this now. And he ended up winning the whole thing. So um, I'm, I'm very sorry I was busy playing second edition at the time, but that must have been a, a sight to behold. Two questions, Johannes. Step one, can you still do that today with the rules and the virtual rules today? Yes. Second Nothing question, is it only first contact where pulling out an outside pack is, is, is legal or are other packs uh, as uh, well? It's only first contact. That's also the, the reason mm -hmm. why I'm still keeping, I think it's three or four, if I ever want to play uh, Borg and, and just, just do that. So great. So now there's going to be a target on your back at all these <laughs> world championship events where folks know that Johannes has got your, the first contact pack ready to go uh, in his pocket. <laughs> well, great way to end first contact. Again, a big point of transition. You know, Dan, you mentioned your brother, you're not playing as much time. You know, for me, certainly this was kind of the last set. And now we're talking about the rules being more complex, different. And, you know, a lot of people are, again, kind of holding on or hoarding those packs because of the gameplay. Um, with first contact but moving forward i'm excited because the game is going to be dramatically different uh, i'll be looking at it with with fresh eyes not having opened any other any other packs i'm just excited to hear about the future uh, of uh, of star trek ccg